Hello dear students, welcome to Extra Maths. Today we are having physics mock test discussion for ICSC class 10th. I know you all must be pretty excited for that. You all must be thinking how and what will be the pattern in your ICSC exam. So here we have a mock test discussion and don't worry even if you are joining here and you don't have that particular paper, you can find that in the details section. So just go through the details. Now, let us start about this. So, the first question here is, I will be giving you the marks also that what are the total number of marks that are allotted to that particular question and we have to give answer according to that. See that important thing in these type of questions are the marking scheme. You have to be very vigilant about what are the total number of marks that are in an exam. If a question is of two marks or three marks, the examiner is expecting some points to be noted, some particular points that you have to give them so that accordingly they can give you the marks. A single one mark question if it is given to you that needs apt and to the point answer. So for example this question is here a string is tied between two fixed rods. We have two fixed rods and there is a string which is tied between them. It is stretched first and then we are releasing it. So if we are considering no resistance from the medium, now this word is very important. The moment we are seeing this, no resistance, that means one thing. So these are the four options. The first option is it will move and after some time it will stop. Another one is it will not stop moving in the absence of the external force. It will not move at all. It won't move and none of these. If you feel that not even a single option is correct, then it is none of these. So the answer for this one is not stop moving in the absence of external force. Here what is happening is there is no external force that is acting. No resistance means this. So the moment you notice this, you will understand there will be no damping. And when there will be no damping, there will be no stopping of the motion because there is absence of external force. So another objective question, S resistors. There are S number of resistors and individual resistance is having the resistance X and all of them are connected in parallel. So once my dear students, all of them are connected in parallel, you have to choose the right answer. Now if you want to solve this type of question, you need to have some prerequisite information, a very crucial information that is generally given in our classes. The answer will be the value of equivalent resistance will be X by S. And how to solve it? Let us take an example. So suppose we have N resistances. But the important thing is all the resistance are same. So let us take suppose 10 ohm resistance, 10 ohm resistance. I will take just 3, 10 ohm. Right now let us take a case where there are 3 resistance. All of them are parallel to each other and there are only 3 of them. So here if you want to find equivalent resistance, what we need to do? I have told you. So 1, 2, 3, all of them are 10 ohm divided by N. R by N, that is the formula you have to remember. So here also it is 3.33 ohms, that is equivalent. So whenever in parallel you have to find equivalent, suppose there is one another resistance added, the answer will be 10 by 4. And similarly when we are in series, the combination of series where end to end joining is there, what we will do? R equivalent will be simply R into N. So using these formulas, we can easily solve this type of question. I hope this is totally done to you. Now we, in this question, we have to tell which of the following statements is correct. We are given four statements about the double pole switch. It is a particular type of switch and you should know the answer. So the answer here is D1. The live as well as the neutral wires, they both are connected to the double pole switch. If you don't have the paper for this particular mock test discussion that we are doing, just go through the link, you will find that particular link of the physics paper that is given there. So, now what is happening in this? See, when we have a single pole switch, you have the connection for the live wire, it is broken up, this is the live wire that is going on. But when we talk about double pole, so both live as well as neutral, both of them are cut. So this is ensuring more, better efficiency, this is ensuring that there is no chance of mishappening. So a double pole switch, from now on you should remember live and neutral wire, both of them are connected. Let us move on to the next question that we have. This is also for one mark, direct objective question. 
the first 10 questions are objective and you should try to attempt as many as them possible in a very short span of time. They are direct to the point you have to see, you have to choose. So, a magnetic field is directed on a plane of paper from left to right. Now, I hope you all know which law will be used here. If you know, just comment on the chat box which particular law or rule we will be using whenever we know about the direction of magnetic field and the movement of electron. One very important hint that is here is current is not the flow of electron. Current is the flow of proton. So if current is flowing, we assume positive charge is flowing. And in that circuit, from the opposite direction, the negative charge or the electron must be flowing. For example, if this is a circuit. So if current is flowing from this positive terminal of the battery, that means maybe proton is moving here. If we talk about electron, it is traveling from the opposite direction. Once we know this concept, then this question becomes very easy. Why? This magnetic field is there, the direction is from the left to right there is an electron beam. Electron beam's movement is opposite to the movement of current. And it is moving vertically upward. Then what is happening? So you will, in this particular question, use a law that we all know, Fleming's left hand rule. We will take our left hand, we will make a shape of a gun. I have told you all in my regular classes also, and this is the best way to remember. Make it shape like a gun, the law enforcement agency of America, that is FBI. I am telling this because it's a very easy mnemonic. Many students in their crucial exam time get the pressure and they forget which one is what. So just remember FBI, hands up, a very good mnemonic. F is for force, B is for magnetic field. And this I is the current, the direction of current or the direction of proton, the positive one. That is what you need to remember. Here they are asking about electron, that's the opposite. So FBI, once we will solve this, we will use it, the direction of the force will be away from the plane of paper. From left to right, you will make the magnetic field, B1. Electron beam is moving upward. So I, that means current is moving downward. So automatically you have to shift your hand and the thumb will be pointing out. That means away from the plane of paper or in this case, away from the screen. So this is how we know that the option C is correct. And which rule is used? Fleming's left hand rule. Okay. Next question, here also you can understand that if this is a magnetic field where these crosses, we all know one thing that if there is a dot, magnetic field is coming inside from the screen towards you. And if there is a cross as we can witness here, what is happening? When we see this cross, it simply means that the magnetic field lines are going inside. So we have these two conditions, here you can easily witness what is given. So this one that is having no effect is the neutron one. Proton one will follow this rule and electron will follow the opposite of that. So using this, we can also very easily find which one is electron, which one is proton and which one is neutron. Okay, moving on to the next question. This question is also a one mark because we are still moving in the objective and we are on solenoid. Solenoid is a very, very important topic and there are very high chance probability that it will come in your exam now. So a solenoid is connected to a galvanometer. Galvanometer is a device that can measure current as well as its direction. It can have both positive and negative impact of current. When north pole of a bar magnet is bought near one of its ends. Now we all know this topic is from electromagnetic induction. Whenever this coil and there is a magnet which is coming near the coil, what is happening? We all know flux is changing. What is flux? We take a particular area amount of magnetic field lines that are passing through it. If a line is not 90 degree, we take the portion of it which is in the 90 degree component. So all the lines that are passing perpendicularly through an area is called flux. And whenever this magnet is moving near the galvanometer, what is happening? Its flux is changing. And when the flux is changing, current is induced in the coil. So this is what we are witnessing here. There are four options. I would like you all to think which option is correct. If you don't have the paper, you can definitely find it in the link that is given below. Find the paper, try to attempt it simultaneously or else you can first attempt it and then watch this. This mock test is based exactly on the criteria of your original exam that will happen. We have chosen questions very carefully. We have put the marking scheme also in a way that you will need exact amount of time to solve this exam. Okay. 
So A, B, C, D, which option do you deem correct? So the answer for this one is a current will get induced whose direction observed from the end will be anti-clockwise. Now how will this happen? What is the way to do it? Let us try to understand. We have a magnet. North is coming in this direction suppose. When it is coming near, this will try to have a magnetic field because it will have an induced current. And the reason is all these magnetic flux line that are cutting this spring. You all should remember it is a very important concept. This phenomena will happen when there is a relative motion between these two. If these both of these are moving like this, there will be no flux induced. You need to have some relative motion. The between them, some relative motion must be there. If both are moving with 2 meter per second in one direction, nothing will happen. So we need to understand this. Once this flux is there, what will happen? If this north pole is moving towards the coil, the coil will have that side which will try to reduce its effect. So it will have north. First, a north pole will be formed in this side so that this north pole that is coming, it must have the least impact here. And when this north pole will start to go away, south pole will be formed here. So these polarities are based on a law that we all know is Lenz law. Let us see about that also. There is a question about that. So from now on, always need to remember that when this solenoid is connected, you are connecting the north pole of the bar magnet. So the current will get induced when you are the direction observed will be anti-clockwise. The moment we have told you that north is coming, it will be north. So you all know there is a mnemonic, North Pole signifies this. What is this? The arrows are making an anti-clockwise motion. When this magnet is coming near the coil, North Pole, when this magnet is going away, this will be South Pole. And this is because of the Lenz law. So once we have understood this, now we can move on to next question. This question is on your screen. The heat capacity of a vessel is 38 Joule per Kelvin. K, capital K is for Kelvin, never forget this. If it's small k you will write, it will be kilo. The prefix kilo will be used. So whenever you are writing Kelvin, make sure it is capital K. Now, what is the meaning of this statement? Take some time and try to solve this question. We have four options. Is the vessel needing 38 Kelvin for a joule of heat? The vessel needs 38 joule of heat to increase its temperature by 38 Kelvin as it is given. Or there is this option, the vessel needs 38 joule of heat to increase its temperature by 1 Kelvin. So if you will notice all of them and you know about the heat capacity, we all know that here 38 joule, this much vessel needs heat if it wants to increase its temperature by just 1 Kelvin. So per degree Kelvin increment in temperature, you will need this much amount of heat. Once we know this, the reason is heat capacity. Heat capacity is the amount of heat that we need for this particular vessel here if it wants to increase its temperature by 1 Kelvin. So, once we have understood this, let us move on to the next question, question number 7. Here also, the concept of a specific heat capacity is taken. 500 grams of magnesium you have. And the amount of energy that you need, heat that you need to melt it at 650 degrees Celsius is given to you. You have to find the specific latent heat of the magnetism. This magnesium in which you have to find a specific latent heat, you have to use a formula Q is equal to ms delta T or mc delta theta, whatever suits you. Small c or s, both are the symbols for specific heat. In some books it is c, in some books it is s. So now let us start understanding this question. If we have this 500 gram of magnesium, we all know that for 500 gram the heat is given to us. Now we know that in this formula Q is equal to M S delta T, M should be 1 kg because the specific latent heat it is for 1 kg of that material. So we have to just convert it double because 500 gram, so if this much energy is needed for 500 gram, exactly the twice of it will be needed for 1 kg. And the moment we, we got to know about 1 kg, we have understood the specific latent heat. So like that, we can easily find it. It is a very easy question. The moment you see it, you should just multiply it and try to solve it very fast because these questions should take 
ideally 10 to 15 minutes only of your allotted time. The radiation with maximum ionizing power. I have seen many students getting confused between alpha and gamma, beta, x. Which one is having the maximum ionizing power? So it depends upon the mass. If something is heavy, it can strike the particular surface and can emit or make it emit the electrons also. So that is the hint and let us see which answer is correct. The correct answer here is alpha. The thing is, whenever we talk about this alpha, these particles have four times the mass of proton. And the beta particles, it's lots and lots of time, it, nearly about 8000 times mass of the beta particle. So because its mass is more, it will have the highest ionizing power. It can very easily even damage the tissues of our body. So that is why we need to understand the maximum ionizing power. It is alpha. Okay. The speed is entirely a different case. In some questions, they may ask you which one is having the maximum speed. There we need to understand that electromagnetic spectrum, it will have the speed of 299, 792, 458 meter per second, while all those who are having some mass, they will have a little bit less speed. So let us move on. We have understood this question. And now there is a question of a natural frequency and resonance. If the natural frequency of a body is given to you, and it is given 50 hertz here, if you want resonance to happen, then the frequency of the external periodic force, the external body which is helping it to create the resonance, what should be the frequency of that one? We all know this answer is very easy. You should just click it and you should be get going. There are certain questions which are easy and you should be able to identify them in the exam. So that your time, the important and the crucial time is allotted to some other important question. So we have understood this question also. Which of the following radiations have same speed as that of light in a vacuum? We all know the speed of light is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second. Or if we want to understand in our native language, we can say that is 3 lakh kilometer per second. So they are asking which radiation is having same speed of light. If we talk about alpha and beta, they have a little bit of mass and that is playing a very cru crucial role. Cathode rays. Electrons that are emitting CRT tube, we all know in television, old televisions, old monitors, these cathode rays were also used, and gamma. There is one very important concept that this gamma ray is a part of electromagnetic radiation. That means the radio waves that we study, the microwaves that we study, the visible spectrum or the visible range of the light, that means V, I, B, G, Y, O, R, all these colors that we study, all of them form or constitute electromagnetic spectrum and gamma ray is also a part of electromagnetic spectrum. And we have studied that electromagnetic rays travels with the speed of light. So let us see the answer keeping that hint in mind. The answer here is gamma. So gamma will be having the maximum speed. Now we are jumping on to the second portion of our mock test that is the subjective questions. You have to be very careful here. You have to make sure that proper number of marks that question carries. You have to give the allotted time regarding that only. If it is a one mark question, a single point two to three line answer is sufficing your need. But if it is a two marks question, you need at least two very small paragraphs so that they can give you accordingly the marks. Individual both paragraphs should have one one point, a very important point and both of them constitute will give you proper two marks. So here you have to calculate the equivalent resistance of the circuit. And this is for two marks. So if we have to solve a question like this, I hope you all know, we need to know or we need to have the understanding of series and parallel circuits. Once we know that, we can easily solve this type of question. What are we going to do? See, we have to calculate the equivalent resistance. Here there are two, three resistance in this question. And if you want to solve this kind of question, the most easy way is start flowing the current as if you are flowing water. We have studied about current water analogy. And here also what you can do is start the flow of current. So see, till this point A, current is intact. It is not dividing. Now current has two paths. So some of the current will go in this upper portion, but here also it is the same route. So this will be 
a little portion of current. Some portion of current will go through this lower 10 ohm resistance. And then they both will join again. At what point? At this B point and they will add again to form the original current that is passing through this battery. So this understanding is very very crucial that at this A point there is a division happening and that division this yellow colored current is passing through 5 ohm as well as another 5 ohm. And this color coding will help you to understand that 1 and 2 they are in series and the equivalent of that we will find 5 and 5 that is R1 plus R2 10 ohm. 10 ohm will be parallel to the another 10 ohm. Once we have understood this, we can say R equivalent for the whole circuit in this condition is how much? 10 and 10. We have just studied the formula 10 by N that means 10 by 2, it will be 5. So equivalent current here will be 5 and we will be able to solve it. So for series it was 10 ohm. Then we will find the parallel formula, we will find this 5 ohm and once we have found this final answer, we will use the formula V is equal to IR and once we are using V is equal to IR, we will very easily get this is 10 volt, overall this is 5, so 10 by 5 is 2 ampere and here is the answer. So you need to tell this, if you want full marks in this question, you have to tell them or you can draw this color coding or else you can tell that 1 and 2 are in series and this 10 ohm is in parallel with the equivalent resistance of 1 and 2. Once we have done this, you will be definitely sure to get full marks. We have calculated the current in the circuit, we have calculated equivalent resistance in the circuit. Now there is another question for 1 and 2 marks. In what condition the boiling point and condensation point are same? So there are certain conditions when boiling point and the condensation point, they both are same. And it is actually same for pure substances. Whenever we take pure substances, both of these points are same. If you will see this, what is boiling? So in boiling, there is a particular temperature at which the boiling starts. But when this is happening, you need to understand that condensation is the change of state. Whenever there is a gas, it is converting to a liquid. The most common example is you have a glass of water, you take a stainless steel or a plastic jug or glass and there is a very cold water inside it outside from the fridge. After some time there will be small tiny droplets that will be visible on the outer surface and that is because the gas that is the atmosphere surrounding it is getting converted into liquid and that is a condensation. So condensation is the point where this temperature the vapor is condensing into a liquid without the change in temperature, the temperature change is not happening. But for boiling, we have to move to a constant, a particular temperature and at that critical temperature, boiling will start. This condition is same for a pure substance. If you have a pure substance, the boiling point and the condensation point are same. But if you will have a mixture, then they will be different. So the answer is you should have a pure substance in that condition they both will be having the same condition. Okay, the lakes or ponds still do not freeze even when the temperature goes below zero degrees Celsius. Even right now in Canada and in many other countries, there is a layer of ice on the top of the lake. But even then the aquatic fishes are surviving. The whole ecosystem is surviving and there's a reason for that. The reason is, how is freezing happening? So whenever you want something to freeze, Suppose there is water and you want this water to freeze. So you have to take out, you have to extract how much calorie? You have to extract 80 calories from it. So there is water in front of you, extract 80 calories, it will convert into ice. This is what is happening. Even in your refrigerator. So that much energy is released and then it is converting. So that is why the cooling is slow. The first reason is that cooling is very slow. It is not a very fast process that within a day or overnight it will happen. Another thing is, because at 4 degrees Celsius water has an anomalous expansion. We all know ice is lighter. It flows on the top. So that layering is also on the top. And this ice layer which is on top, it is actually creating a preventive sheath. And that sheet or sheath that we say, it is helping the lower portions to remain in liquid state. 
So this is what you need to tell. You need to tell both of the conditions. First, you need to tell that this much energy is needed from every one gram of water. So that is a huge energy. So it is a very slow process. And second one is from the top because of the anomalous expansion of water, the top layer is formed and that is preventing further freezing. So when you will give these two points, you will properly get two marks. Okay, moving on to another question here. Draw a current carrying solenoid. You have to draw a current carrying solenoid. I hope you all know what solenoid is. A form of a spiral coil. And if you want it to behave like an electromagnet, what we need to do? We need to put a soft iron core inside it and provide a DC current. That makes it an electromagnet. So we have drawn it, a simple coil. There is no core. We don't want it to behave like an electromagnet right now. It's just a solenoid. And we have given some DC current. It will start producing magnetic field lines and if you will put a soft iron core inside it, it will exactly behave like a bar magnet. So we will draw it. Now which end will act like a north pole and which end will act like a south? Palm rule can be used for that. There are two rules. One is the easiest one is palm rule. The current is going from here. What we can do is first one is the current is coming and see making a clockwise turn. And we know from the mnemonics, clockwise turn is the south pole. So solenoid will have south pole here. Another method is, all these wires that you see, like this, from the front. So they are having current in this direction. So we will take our palm, we will try to touch all those directions of the current. With our palm, we'll try to engulf it. And our thumb will point the north pole. So once we will try to just place our fingers here, north pole will be shown in this direction. So we have found north. Both of these methods are accurately correct and you can tell both of them according to the numbers. So here because the question is totally of four marks, you should definitely tell both the rules. That will help you out. So all the students here and some students who are new also, if you haven't attempted this paper when we gave it to you, there is a link that is given in the description. Go through that link, open the paper, try to attempt it simultaneously or else first you can attempt and then you can watch this video. This is an exact replica of the test that will be happening in your exams. The marking scheme and the level of questions are also very similar. The reason is that we are trying to give you that perfect edge because you all have not given these type of written exams for a long amount of time. It may be possible that you have, you, you don't know exactly how to put your thoughts into words. So this is the best way to do it. Okay, so the second portion is we have told you which end will act like a north pole and which end will act like a south pole. How can we increase the strength of a magnetic field? If you have a solenoid, there are many ways to increase the strength. The first way is increase the number of coils in the solenoid. If you will increase the number of coils, the strength will increase. Another thing is you can increase this current. You can add one more battery with the same polarity so that it may not cancel it out. And then because of that, the strength will increase. And one more method is there. If you will put a soft iron core inside it, the strength will increase. Don't put a steel core. Steel core will make it a permanent magnet. Even after you will turn off this particular device, what will happen if you have a steel core, it will already be magnetized, it will not regain into a normal steel. So we use the soft iron core so that the moment we turn it off, it behaves like a normal material. So I hope now you know this, whenever we are studying about solenoid in this condition, if I suppose current is going from here, see, I can see it is behaving like this N. See inside like this. That is why this will be the North Pole. So this is the rule N and S. S will be essentially clockwise. So this method you can utilize or you can utilize that current is going like this. See how the current is going in these wires. So our fingers will just engulf it and our thumb will be pointing in this direction. This will be North Pole. So both the methods are equally correct. You should use both the methods to cross check so that in exams you may never be wrong. Okay. This is question three. There are certain A and B sections. The marks are two comma one. The first one is there is a graph that is showing variation of temperature of a solid substance. So here the temperature is varying. And how much amount of heat 
that is also given amount of heat in joules. Now they are giving you the substance is there and specific heat is provided. You have to tell the mass of the substance. I have already told you there is a formula, a direct formula Q is equal to ms delta theta or Q is equal to mc delta t. In some books you may see it like this, m s delta theta. This delta theta is also the change in temperature, S is also the specific heat capacity, don't worry about it. Both the formulas are exactly the same. So using any one of them which is written in your book, go through it, make M as the subject, it will be Q upon S delta theta. So S value is given 400 joules per kg per degree Celsius. That means if you have 1 kg of substance to increase 1 degree Celsius temperature, you need 400 joule of energy. This is what is the meaning of a specific heat capacity. We are using it, making M as the subject, we will get 0 0.625 kg. This is the mass that is needed. Now they are asking, find the specific latent heat of fusion. Latent heat, we all know what is latent heat. I have even written here. The physical state is changed. You are having water, suddenly ice is there. You are having water, suddenly steam is there. So these type of phase changes, that we need to understand here. So whenever this phase change is happening, we need to understand temperature is not changing. So because temperature is not changing, this is what is depicting the phase change. Once we know that Q is equal to ML is the formula that can also be used. But here we don't even need that. What we can do here is from this figure we need to see when this change is happening, 1000 joule to 2000 joule, this 1000 joule of energy was needed. And how much is this 1000 joule per kg per Kelvin? Just divided by mass, you will get the specific latent heat in this condition. Using Q is equals to ML, so M is Q by L. So they are finding it and because of that, we can easily find it. So this question 2 and 1, you need to draw the graph, you need to tell that in this portion phase change is happening, the temperature is constant, see, 40. Whenever this phase change is happening, temperature is not changing. We need to understand this. So once we have understood this question, we can move forward to the next one. Why is switch always connected to a live wire? So we have a live wire, we have a neutral wire, we have an earthing. This switch that is cutting off the supply, we know the definition of switch. It is just cutting off the supply, cutting off the circuit, circuit breaker. So it is always connected to a live wire. Why don't we connect it to a neutral wire? Will, it, will the circuit still work? Is it not good enough? What will happen if we connect it to a neutral wire? You should tell each and every of these options. When you are giving the answer of this, you should also tell that what will happen when you are connecting to a neutral wire. Then you will be getting full marks. Then you have to give two reasons for using MCB instead of fuse. We need to understand that switch can definitely work as a circuit breaker when it is connected to neutral. You connect it to neutral and you are give, uh, just turning off the switch, the line is broken, there will be no flow of current. But the problem is the live will still be functioning. And if somebody else, suppose I am touching that live wire, so because of the potential difference, the current will flow in that particular portion. Even though in the circuit it may be broken, but if some external thing touches it, and because of the potential difference, I will be getting that shock, that is why we try to stop it. So it does not prevent the live wire to let the current flow. And we don't want current to flow through the live wire. And that is why we have made sure that switches are connected to live wire. What you need to understand is that even if you are dismantling the neutral by a switch, even that the functional, the circuit will be broken and no current will flow. But if you, we will touch the live wire or something else touches, a hazardous shock can be there. Now there is something called fuse and we know there is something called miniature circuit breaker. These are new devices, they have electronic configurations also and these are simply old style fuses that are having a melting point kind of wire that will melt if excessive heat is generated, uh, excessive amount of current is passing. So what is the advantage of using this MCB, miniature circuit breaker? Well, it avoids the inconvenience of connecting a new fuse. What happens is the fuse melt 
a simple fuse that we all use, it has a wire and if more than the required amount of current will pass through wire, wire will melt. But in MCB, it just shuts off and we can go and manually turn it on. So we don't need to replace. In fuse, you need to replace fuse each and every time. But if you are having an MCB, you just go turn the connection again on after resolving the conflict. So once the conflict, whatever you are happening in the circuit, that is resolved, you can again turn on the MCB. It is much safer to use. The accuracy and the precision of an MCB is very high. Fuse, it is not that good. They are sure shot, they will definitely melt, but they are not that efficient. They are based on thermal properties. So that are, they are not that much good connected to MCBs. So I hope this question is also clear. Now we have a question that is having one, 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 four marks question, but they are divided into four parts. So very crisp answer is needed in these type of questions. Let us see. The specific heat capacity is given. We all know the formula Q is equal to MS delta T. It is given 5 joule per kg per Kelvin. And the specific heat capacity of another substance is also provided to us. They are saying which of the two substance, if they have the same mass and the dimensions also, will be transferring more heat at a faster rate. So which will be having faster rate? The specific heat capacity, which is larger. So if A is having high specific heat capacity, it will be transferring at a larger rate. Justify the answer. That is very easy. We have already justified because this Q that is heat is proportional to C or S that is a specific heat capacity. So the greater specific heat capacity, greater will be the rise in temperature. So that is the answer C. Even one important thing is that their masses are same. We have taken their masses to be same. If masses are different, then it is a different ball game. How will we judge a huge 1000 liter of bucket of water and 1 kg of ice? We cannot compare. So this portion is very, very important for us to give to you. We have to take equal amount of masses. That is why the unit is 5 joule per kg per Kelvin. We are comparing 1, 1 kg quantity of both the substances. So once we have understood this, we can use the formula Q is equal to MC delta T. We will put the values. If the mass of the substance B is 6 kg, we know 6 kg is given. What will be the amount of heat it will need to increase its temperature by 10 degrees Celsius. Delta T is 10 degrees Celsius. We will use them. We will get the answer. Okay. A specific heat capacity, I hope you are able to understand with the unit. Joule per kg per degree Celsius. That means if you have 1 kg of substance and you want to increase its temperature by 1 degree Celsius, then how much amount of energy is needed? Now the important thing is, from uh, suppose we take the example of water. So from 60 degree Celsius to 61 degree Celsius, 1 kg of water, it will take 4200 joule of energy. But try to understand, this is not valid when we are at 100 degrees Celsius of water and it has to convert into 100 degrees Celsius of vapor. That is an entirely different condition, okay? Because there the phase change is happening. So temperature will not increase, okay? So we have understood this. So copper block, aluminum block and water, they all are related. You can understand 4200 joule per kg per degree Celsius energy is needed for water and it is more than aluminium. That is the shocking fact. It may seem unreal, but this is true. Aluminium will get heat faster than water. Okay, another question, and this is of three marks, you have to draw a displacement time graph for a natural and damped vibration. So these questions, you need to understand the diagram should be very crisp, very clear, and there should be a proper correlation. You have to draw them alongside you have to draw natural, you have to draw damped also. So this one is damped, this is undamped natural sustained oscillation. Here the amplitude is fixed. Whatever amplitude we have, it will remain the same throughout the oscillation. But here because of some external resistance, the damping or slowly this oscillation will fade out. So the amplitude will keep on decreasing and the oscillation is fading out. So the maximum value here is at one point and then it is decreasing. But here the maximum value is touched again and again. 
generally this is an ideal case of vibration. So we will draw both of the diagrams in order to get proper marks with the markings also. You have to tell it would be even better if one or two lines about the maximum value here it is only achieved one time here all the amplitudes are same. If you are describing these points then you are the probability of getting full numbers increase many fold. Okay. Another question and that is define lens law. Lens law is a very very important topic. Let me say that it has very high chances, very high probability of coming in your examinations. So, lens law you have to define. Now, whenever you have to define, make sure that you know a proper statement. You should write down that statement and if possible, you should try to learn that also. Because the exact wordings matter whenever you are defining or whenever you are stating a law. So, then they are asking how can we find the direction of induced current using this law. What is the way we can find the direction of induced current? Now I hope you all know this portion is from electromagnetic induction and I hope you know what is happening here. So once we have understood this, the definition is that the current that is induced in a circuit, suppose we have a circuit like this, okay, and there is a magnet that is coming near it. So the current induced in a circuit due to the change in magnetic field. Now here this flux will change. We have discussed about flux. Try to understand that flux will play a very important role in attaining maximum marks in your exam. You have to explain flux in a very proper way. Make a diagram if possible and tell that the perpendicular portion of the magnetic field. If some magnetic field is in this direction then the component should also be taken from an area that is what constitutes flux. So here what is happening, in this question we will explain that when this magnet is moving near to this coil, what is happening? Flux is changing. And when this magnet is going away from the coil, what is happening? Flux is changing. But imagine if both of them are stationary, they are not moving, then what is happening? Then flux is not changing. So if you bring this magnet near, flux will change. If you have a galvanometer here, suppose we have a galvanometer. So galvanometer will deflect to one side. Then you will take away this particular bar magnet. De this deviation will be on the opposite side. The reason is different poles are formed. We will study about that also here only. But if you will bring it and then stop, the galvanometer will also become zero. It, because there is no relative change, no flux will be there. Because of that, no change in flux we need to understand there will be no induced current at that time. So, the current induced in a circuit due to a change in magnetic field is directed, this is very important, to oppose the change in flux and to exert a mechanical force which opposes the motion of the magnet. Now, if you want to understand this, what is happening? When this magnet is coming near the coil, the coil says, no, no, don't come. It does not want the magnet to come near. But opposite is also true. When this magnet is going away, the coil does not want it to go away also. It wants no change. When the magnet is going away, it wants it not to go away. When it is coming near, it wants not to come near. And that is why the currents are induced such that the magnetic field is created. Here when it is coming near, north will be formed. When it is going away, south will be formed so that it is attracted. So here repulsion is there, here attraction is needed. And this is how the poles are formed in this coil. Okay, I hope this is understood. And now they are saying how can we find the direction of induced current. It is very easy with the help of the clock rule. We can determine the polarity and hence the direction. Let me help you out. Whenever we are discussing this lens law, you need to understand that suppose this magnet is coming near. So what will happen? We need to understand just one thing this particular coil would want a north pole to be formed here. Now how the north pole will be formed? North pole will be formed when the current will flow because we know this thumb shows the north pole. So in this ring, the current has to flow like this. This is the outside portion of the ring towards you. This is the deep inside portion. So current has to go like this so that the north pole is formed and this will repel this magnet. So here it is very easy for us to understand this is the center. 
okay so the moment this magnet is moving near to the coil it will form a north pole so as to oppose the motion to apply a force that is opposing the movement of this bar magnet so once we have understood this let us move on to the next question there are three portions in this question question number 4 part 3 you can go to the description of this video and you will find a mock test paper there and i would recommend you try to solve it in a real world scenario attempt it in a proper way and then you can see this whole solution and you can judge yourself you can understand even how to write these answers see even extra unnecessary writing will hamper your chance of getting maximum marks if there is a one mark question and you will write a singular page or 200 words or 300 words that won't help you out you need to be very crisp in these short answers so if x is a type of radiation what is it called you can see this and they are asking what is this x so this is a very direct answer you all have studied you all know here beta emission is happening there is two type of beta emissions beta minus decay beta plus decay and we all know this is what is happening here now what is its rest mass we need to understand this that here generally in your exams you write zero and the reason is it is 1837 times less than that of a proton a proton has substantial mass than the electron which is emitted here so because mass of electron is very very less it is generally termed near to zero it is all about near to zero the reason is it is not exactly zero but it is near to zero because 1 upon 1837 this much times less is the mass of the electron that is being emitted compared to the proton and if we see this question so if we have to find if the 6 is given as the atomic number of the parent nucleus then find the number of protons in the daughter nucleus we can easily see z plus 1 is happening add one of them the answer will be 7 so i hope this is also truly understandable to you the beta particle is a little bit more information whenever it is emitted we all know that electron is being emitted so if this beta emission is happening from the atomic nucleus it is not one of those electrons which are surrounding in the shells this nuclei lies above the band of stability whatever is the stable spectrum it is above that so emission of an electron does not change the mass number we need to understand mass number will not change but it increases the number of its protons and decreases the number of its neutrons once we know this concept we can easily give the answer so that is what you need to remember a very good example is this one you can see here also this is the emission sometimes e is written or sometimes they even write b beta emission so this is the beta decay or the emission that is happening and this example can help you make sure that you get full marks whenever you write this kind of example it gives the examiner a perspective that you have a perfect knowledge about this question so you should definitely go through it you should definitely tell them that it is nothing but an emission of an electron and the mass number is not changing keeping this in mind let us move on to the next question question number 5 first part what is a three pin plug this is a very common plug that is used in generally the appliances that are withdrawing large amount of current there is a reason for this plug and that is very scientific it is not just for an aesthetic value although there are two reasons and you should give both of them another one is what is the top pin of the three pin plug called why is it made long and thick so try to attempt this all the three questions are here theoretical so you have to make sure that when you are explaining this kind of question where the whole of the portion is having theory only make sure you are writing in points we at extra marks actually have these kind of mock tests and even here you can find the link in the description so what you need to understand is that even if you have forgotten how to write them because for the most of time for the last 2 years you have attempted objective questions only so you should try to understand that in every question you need to point out the certain important points and make them a point wise chart only when you are giving a point wise answer the the probability of getting full marks increase a long paragraph is never accepted by an examiner so whenever we talk about a three pin plug we all know 
that all electrical devices we have, they are provided with extension of a cable and there is a plug at the end, it is having three metallic pins and you should draw the diagram also. Here the upper one, one thing is that the, uh, the material is ebonite of the body and steels are there. So the earthing terminal is longer and thicker than the rest of the two. And what is the top pin of the three plug called? Earthing. The bigger plug is called earthing. We have a diagram also. And why is it made long? There are two reasons. It is made longer and thicker. The reason it is made thicker is so that you never get confused where you have to place it. It should not look like a triangle that all ways on in any direction you can just apply. If all of them are same size, then you may get confused about the position. So one of them is made thicker. So that that confusion is gone. But why is it made longer? Because even before the live and neutral wires or the circuits are attached, the earthing must be completed so that any excessive electrons in the appliance, they go directly to the earth. We all know that earth has a huge affinity for the electrons. So all those excessive electrons should go to earth. We should be safe from getting a shock. So that is the reason it is made long and thick. And in this way, we should understand this one is the wider also. I have told you the reason of wider. It is for aesthetic and geometrical understanding so that we don't invert it in any angle. And it is longer so that it touches first. The connection is touched initially from the earthing portion. And this is made up of ebonite. So now let's go on to the second portion of the fifth question. What is the quality of sound? Now quality of sound is something that even if there are two person, try to understand if there are two person and both of them are having a sound which is of same amplitude. The frequency is also same. Even then, if you know both of them, you will be able to distinguish with your eyes closed. So even if your eyes are closed, the frequency of both the person is same, the amplitude produced is same, then what is the difference? That difference is the quality. So you need to understand that quality is that and on which characteristic it depends? It depends upon the waveform. Maybe both of them are having the same amplitude, same frequency, but maybe their waveforms are different. So the amplitude and the frequency may be same, but the quality is differing and that is the characteristic of waveform. So you have to draw these kind of diagrams also. And the amplitudes of two sound A and B, the ratio is given, which of them will be louder. I generally give a very good example for that if you have a TV and the speakers are producing huge bass, the small air particle will be doing the amplitude. And because of that, the higher the amplitude because of the bass, the louder the sound. So it depends upon the win, which one is having the higher amplitude, the sound will be louder. So we have understood all these questions. Let us move on to these we have understood sound is characterized by pitch, quality and loudness. And quality or timber is something that allows the ears to distinguish even if the pitch and the loudness is same. So we have understood this. Let us see what is tracers and what are the isotopes that are used to control the thickness of material in the industries. Now these tracers are certain radioactive isotopes. For example, if you are having some problem in kidney, so doctor will give you these tracers and the doctor will be able to trace where they are, which path they have taken. So these are called tracers. They are generally used for diagnosis. And they are asking which isotope is used to control the thickness. So we all know beta radiations are used. They are used to control the thickness because they can penetrate very high. And that is why they have many industrial usages. Now, these are certain points that you need to understand. They are given here. Radioactive chemicals are used. They are not harmful because even if in diagnosis they can be used, they have short half-life. They decay before damaging. They are not poisonous and they can readily pass out of the body. So we have understood this and we have told you that tracers are used in hydraulic fracturing. Some crack is there, they will go in in the rock layers, they will be able to find out where there is a crack. So these things are very useful. Let us move on to this very easy question of 1, 1, 1 marks each. We have to arrange alpha, beta and gamma in descending order of their speed. You should understand inertia is the measurement of mass and if something is heavy it will move slowly. So here gammas are the fastest because they are a part of electromagnetic radiation. They travel with the speed of light. 
and if we talk about maximum ionizing power, mass plays a role. So mass of alpha rays is highest, so it will have the maximum ionization power. Now this is something that you really need to learn. You should write it down 5 to 10 times before your exams so that you always learn these kind of reactions. So which nuclear reaction is showing the emission of this rays? We have uranium conversion to thorium. That is giving you this exact answer. So we have understood this. We should know about mass number and atomic number in certain kind of reactions. You should go through them before the exams. Generally, most of the students get confused. This is also a question where external periodic force of some frequency is applied. Natural frequency is given. Now we know in these kind of questions what happens is, if the frequency of external one is 50 hertz, then the new frequency of the body will is starting to be same so that the resonance occurs. So it will also be how much? It will be 50 hertz. And if it will be 30 hertz for the external, then it will be 30 hertz because the resonance has to happen. And we all know that in these two cases, if you are asking about the change in amplitude, then in the case of amplitude in A, it will be decreasing as we can see, and there will be an increase in B. This is a very direct application of resonance. You should be able to solve this in a very limited amount of time. Now this question, if you see, two bulbs of resistance are given to you in parallel with a source, which of them will consume more power? So one resistance, two resistance connected to a battery. A biggest confusion of many students is that which formula to use. They know formula of power is V into I. But which one to use here? So always remember, whenever you are in parallel, parallel connections, use V square by R. Whenever you are having series connection of two, always use I square R. This is what you need to understand. Here we are having parallel connections. So we should go for V square by R. I have seen many students getting confused in this. There is no place for confusion. If you are having parallel, you should go for V square by R. If the, both the resistance are connected in series, use I square R because in series, the current flow is same. So I will be same, so I square R is more feasible. So using that, you can simply find out, you can find the heat generated by V square by R as the power. And we all also know, that whenever we talk about power, it is rate of change of work. So work done upon time and work done is nothing but energy. But from work energy theorem, we can understand. And because of this, energy is power into time. So this formula is used here. Use this formula, energy is equal to power into time, and we are done. So we have attempted this whole question from these conditions we have understood. Here we are using V square by R and here we be, will be using I square R whenever the power dissipation is being asked. So I hope you are able to understand this mock test was exact replica of what you have or of what you will be getting in your ICSC examinations. The amount of time needed will exactly be the same. I would request you all to go through the link, there you have a description of that particular paper. You will get that paper, try to attempt that paper. In extra marks here, we have these type of papers, mock tests ready for you along with our live classes. Whenever you are understanding these concepts that I told you in live classes exactly like this, after that you will be able to solve these questions. You will be getting tests every day. So I would like to tell you all the best for your exams and keep learning with extra marks. There are many, many mock tests that are awaiting for you and you should try to make the best use of that. Because of this previous year, you were not able to attempt many examinations. So we have a silver lining for you. Try to give maximum examinations like this so that in your proper exams, ICSE exams, you attain full marks. All the best from the Extra Marks team and we hope to meet you soon. Thank you.